Put them in. Hello. We're just going to give everyone a minute to get in and then we'll get started. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Still have joining, so yeah. One more, couple more seconds. <laughs> Right. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to the Zen Yarn Garden Tutorial Tuesday. Um, today, we're going to be talking about pooling in yarns. And I know Suzanne covered that a little bit the other week. We'll get, um, we'll talk a bit more about it today, answer some questions. I'm going to demonstrate some of the techniques I had in my crosshatch wrap, and we'll talk about that too. Also, my name is Shana Billow, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've done some of these tutorials for Zen before, but I'm a knitwear designer and knitting teacher from Northern New Jersey, and I love working with Zen yarns and being here with all of you. Um, so thanks for being here today. Uh, this is Zen's 42nd Tutorial Tuesday, very exciting, momentous occasion. Uh, we'll be giving away two $20 gift certificates throughout um, our festivities tonight. So be sure to open up your chat box because that's where we will be choosing a winner from when you respond to a question that Suzanne may ask. Um, so yeah, I think I'll turn it over to Suzanne to say hello and maybe Laura just to say uh -huh. hi. <laughs> Hi, I just get to be the model today and um, help with the chats and everything, but um, yeah, and Laura is here too, so she's going to be doing, taking care of the, the chats and, and adding links to the chat and, and pulling questions and stuff. Yes, and Laura knit this sample too, so she's going to chime in with um, some specifics on that. And yeah, so feel free to answer or ask questions in the chat and we'll, there's lots of us here tonight to help. So we should be able to get okay. to everything. I've, I've already put the link for the crosshatch wrap on Ravelry in um, the chat. And then uh, everything that we're doing tonight is being worked in our Jump in the Pool yarns from Zen Yarn Garden. Uh, those are available in gradient trios. Um, and you can purchase those. I've put a link to um, the pooling collection um, and that those gradient trios come in three 200 yard skeins for a total of 600 yards, which is exactly what I used to knit the crosshatch. So now I'm gonna pull, mute myself and uh, <laughs> let you guys go ahead. Oh, welcome. Thank you. Suzanne, it looks phenomenal on you. Do you want me to show it off a little bit more? Yeah, let's chat a little... bit about the design. Yeah, yeah so this is, um, let's see, I'll, I'll try and get all of it. It is like seven, seven feet long, you said, Laura, right? So um, yeah, it's point, pretty long. Point to point, I think I measured it at close to 80 inches, but of course there are some real thin sections at the points. So I don't, I don't know if you entirely oh, count that in the length. But it's really nice. You can wear it like a scarf or you you can do it on your shoulders. I like to, you know, do this uh, side first and then bring it over the top and over. You could do like a little cowl shoulder thing, or you could even just, um, you know, do the fold in half, wrap around and pull through. Um, anyway, just lots of different ways to wear this one. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, the, the way you're wearing it now is the way that I like to wear mine. Um, mm -hmm. And I liked, I specifically designed this piece that's that it starts and ends with a point so that in no place in the design do you ever have your pooling color just flat, like in a cast on or bind off edge. And I'll explain that as we're, as I'm showing you my um, demonstration here of the stitch that we use. So yeah, it's Yay. fabulous, so fun. So the shawl right. is, it's, it's more of a parallelogram shape. Um, so, first of all, um, I know you may have covered a little bit of this with Suzanne already in previous um, installation of our tiny tutorial, our tutorial Tuesdays. But um, what you want to do, what pooling means in yarn, is that you perhaps have a repeated color 
that all of a sudden creates its own pattern. So here I have this little dress that I made with increasing. And at one point, all the increases lined up to have it work with my yarn that I got this repetition right here, right at like the belt of the dress. So that was kind of a neat way that the yarns pooled in this dress. And you can see in other areas of the dress, it did not pool the yarn. So pooling happens when you get just the right number of stitches within your skein of yarn. So for example, in the Zen Yarn Garden, which color is this jump in the pool, Scarlet, um, here you can see this big skein of yarn has half of the color being one color here and the other half is a speckle. So whenever you encounter a yarn like this that has very uh, definitive portions of color throughout the skein that go completely through, that's a yarn that has the potential to pool if you want it to. So I just designed a cowl um, with Zen Yarns too, and I got a little bit of a slight pooling. You can see it there here at the top of the cowl, um, a little bit of a pool with the Xena colorway, which I love. So sometimes that turns into an element of our design that we want to be there. Um, hopefully you want it to be there if it happens, right? But um, with the crosshatch wrap, what I ended up doing was assigned pooling where I took a specific color within my skein and anytime I got to that segment of color, I did an exciting stitch. I did something a little different with it. So rather than relying on my stitch count to give me a pattern within my yarn, it's like a little baby hat with tie dye, all right? Rather than relying on my stitch count, I was the architect, so to speak, of the fabric that I was creating. So um, Suzanne, you know what, I will, Suzanne, can we close up on yours for a second and just show right this? Was. Yeah, and yeah. Show let's see what it looks like on your other camera, if it's possible. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Let's do that. Um, Thanks so much. Just so you can see the stitch here and what I did, or what I designed for the yeah. stitch. So beautiful. So the yarn was half purple and half splashed with orange and pink and yellow. Anytime Laura, who knit the sample, got to that orange, pink, and yellow she ended up working this really funky stitch that I came up with for the shawl. So right there, these are the so cross cool. hatches. They're wrap mm -hmm. and drops that are cabled. And I'll be demonstrating that for you today. I just wanted mm -hmm. to give you a head, a kind of a sense of why that works. We're looking at certain colors in the skein and that's what we are working our stitch patterns on. So in this case, I used um, a cross hatch stitch. I created that stitch of wrap and like a cabled wrap and drop. You could also do bobbles, you could do purl stitches, you could do little florets, lots of different, you can do lots of different things anytime you hit that color in your yarn that you want to create that pool with. All right, so this is one way to make your hand dyed yarns work for you. This is, yeah, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so Let's dig into it and I will demonstrate how I worked the crosshatch stitch. And again, if you have questions, feel free to pop them up into the chat. We'll be um, answering them. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to talk more about any of the questions you may have about pooling. All right, so here we go. With the crosshatch, oh, and this is the color I'm using, the Jump in the Pool Scarlet from the Gradient Trio. Okay. So with the crosshatch wrap, you're going to start the shawl in the shape that I had mentioned. And again, the reason I started with the point is because I didn't want this to end up at one end of the shawl where you see that straight line of color. I wanted only cross hatches to show up in that color. But here for us today, I was just, I just cast on for our swatch, I did this. Okay, so I worked a row of knit and this whole row in knit was all in my red color, my background color. I'm about to hit a portion of the yarn that is my pooling color, this white section here. So what I did for the crosshatch wrap is I worked up to that point where I have my pooling color. So right here, maybe I'll work one more stitch. I'm just on the cusp of it. Here you can kind of go either way. If you wanted to include that in the first crosshatch stitch, you could. It doesn't totally matter. Just whatever you do, do it consistently. So here we are. I'm ready with my working yarn being the cross, the, the pooling color. I'm inserting my needle into the stitch and I'm going to wrap around 
three times. I'm wrapping my yarn around the needle three times before pulling it through. So you'll notice a normal purl stitch has just one loop on my right hand needle. The cross hatch stitch has three loops. And I'll show you in English style too, for those of you who are not continental knitters, you're going to go down, wrap once, twice, three times around, and then bring that straight up and out. Okay, just in the efforts of time, I'm just gonna switch back over to continental. So one, two, three through. So I have three loops for every stitch that go on my right hand needle. And I'm just going to keep doing that. I'm not even going to bother counting what I'm doing. I'm just doing one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, until I end up at the other end of the pooling color. So I'm getting there. It's coming. Okay, close. I feel like Carlo Guthrie waiting around on the guitar for the refrain to come again. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. So I've got a lot of these stitches here. And then here I'm just about at the end. So you can decide as you start knitting yours, you'll decide with that span whether or not you want to do maybe just two wraps, or if you want to just call that the end of the color and do a single wrap there instead. Um, which is what I'll do here just because I'm getting nervous that I'm at the edge of my piece. All right, so fabulous. I turn this around and now I have an incredible amount of loops on the needle here. All right, and let's just count them in advance. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so what I'm going to do on the next row, I've got 12 of these loops. This is what's going to turn into my cross hatch. Okay, so I'm going to start knitting the row. And then when I encounter these stitches that I've wrapped three times, now I'm going to turn them into the cross hatch. So I'm going to slide this stitch over one, slide the next stitch over two, slide the stitch over and let those loops drop. So I'm going to do that for all 12 of my stitches. And as you're doing this, you may end up with 11 stitches. You may end up with 10 stitches. There may be portions with eight stitches. The beauty of the cross hatch is that it works no matter how many stitches you have. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit about the edges of the piece and where that, where that flexibility comes in handy. So I have 12 loops on my needle. What I'm going to do is at the halfway point, the first six, I'm going to insert my needle into the first six. Let me drop the yarn for a moment. The first six, so here we have three, six. I'm going to put my needle into these stitches here and drag them over the second group of six stitches without dropping that second group of six stitches. And then I'm going to put that second group here. So I had these loops in order of one through 12. Now there's number seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two, three, four, five, six. So essentially I've cabled them in a sense, or I've wrapped them over one another, and then I knit them. So that's how you achieve the cross hatch stitch. And that works whether you're knitting or purling where on one row you wrap each stitch three times and on the next row you drop those wraps and cable, we'll call it a cable, you cable the stitches so that they cross over one another. And that's how you create that phenomenal stitch. And again, you can do that with any number. So let's say you had 11 wraps instead of 12, you could pull six over the five, pull the extra stitch over the halfway point. So if you don't have an even number, that's okay too. Okay. So that would be the cross hatch stitch right here. And you can see, it's very interesting. That is the stitch that's pooled. Everything else in the background is red, except for my cast on, of course, which we talked about, mm -hmm. but everything else here is red. And so you get that really cool texture on the fabric because of that, um, because of the, stitch that you worked in your pooling color so very cool yes does anyone have questions so far yeah well let's let them like absorb that <laughs> maybe oh, awesome. it was kind of a lot and i'll jump in and do some questions how about very cool well angela <clears throat> had a good one will the cross stitches snag easily 
Angela, I have to say, anytime I wear anything knitted, no matter how densely I've knitted it, I walk into a nail, like in my house. <laughs> it's like, the, so, so I'm not the best person to ask that because clearly whenever I wear my knits, that's when I, that's when I snag everything. But once this is blocked, the stitches really do fall into place and I don't find that they snag. Um, yeah, I haven't had any, you know, I, I did the photography for this one. I was the model <laughs> um, and I didn't have any issues with it uh, snagging. So if that's any consolation, but yeah, like with any knitting, you might get some extra and it might be a little bit easier um, just because you do have a little, little bit longer loops, but in general, they lay really, they lay flat. So, um, but I was going to ask you too, Shana, what did you do? Or maybe Laura too, when you get to an edge, like say you need to turn, is that the next phase? <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that. And someone okay. asked me to show them on a knit row. I'll, I'll definitely demonstrate that. So what, so here I had 12 stitches involved in my crosshatch. Let's say I got to the end of my row in the shawl and I saw I had eight stitches remaining before the end. I would work my crosshatch since eight is a majority of the 12 stitches, more than half. I would work my crosshatch over those eight stitches or I'd work them over six and then do my increasing or decreasing whatever I needed to do on the shawl. Basically you make that call as you get to the end of the row or at the beginning of a row, how many stitches do I have here that could be used for my crosshatch? And you decide whether the crosshatch comes at the end of the row or right when you start the next row. Um, so it's sort of a, it's a call that you'll get used to making as you create the shawl. But again, there's a benefit um, in using a design like this, a stitch like this is it doesn't have to always be 12 stitches. Um, it can be eight, it can be four, you know, it can be any combination of stitches mm -hmm. to create the cross hatch. And there were moments in the shawl where you will just knit or purl in that color, in your pooling color, typically that's going to be over a spot of another pool where you want to move across it so that you're not necessarily stacking all of your cross hatches on one another. They start to look weird if you do that. Um, so that that's just something to consider. And I don't know, Laura, if you have any input on that with your sample. Um, I, I, I will say that the pattern is very complete in terms of what to do with these rows. There are instructions like as you get towards the end of the row or if you want to bring it to the next row. Um, so and and Shana is not working on the bias right now, but because of the bias wrap, you're always increasing at one side of the row and decreasing at the other. So you really always want to leave the two end stitches as knit stitches or purl stitches. Someone asked if this is this is all worked in stock in it, basically. So now you are adding your three wraps when you're purling or you're knitting when you're working in your color. But yes, the wrap is completely in stockinette. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I really, I really did find your pattern very complete on, oh, if you get to the end of the row, what do you do now? Yes. Well, my there, test there knitters lots of notes. were phenomenal. My test knitters were great because I got so many wonderful questions from them that I was able to incorporate everything I was suggesting to them in the pattern notes. Um, so yeah, that definitely helps. But there were some phenomenal questions in the chat. So let me just... Yeah. Yes, yeah, do you want us to read them to you, Shana, or do you want to? see. Um, well, Suzanne, do you want to answer the question from Linda? Would your dance cowl be considered? I actually got that one already. We're yes, good. Yes, did. I missed it. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. No, um, no, no, you're fine. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, I definitely. Know. And I can show like <laughs> this is a different, just a different kind of assigned pooling. It's the same, same idea. Instead of the cross hatch pattern, I just use some German short rows. Um, but it's the same idea. You get to that color, you do something different. Um, and, and like with all of these, there's a little bit of like your own, you know, you know, your own creativity that goes into it because you decide a little bit more like what to do and it changes it. And it's, it's cool. It all comes out. So this is definitely a go with the flow type, uh, you know, these techniques are very go with the flow. <laughs> they sure are. Yes. Any other people. questions? Oh, sorry. But yeah, you do need yarn that will pool. So you yes. need to make sure that your yarn has, if you have a big skein like this that you've opened up, that you have colors that go completely through mm -hmm. like this. But you so, can treat like you have that whole red section, but you kind of treat the whole lighter section as a color on its own. It just has yes. to contrast with well, and I will say, obviously, we'd love it if you bought Zen Yarn Garden Yarns, but we are not the <laughs> only ones dying pooling yarns. So if you have something in your stash, you're welcome to use that as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the try. questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 
I, I was going back to the questions. One of the cross the cross hatches look like there are holes on each side. Do you want to? Yes, talk about that's that part of the bit? design. Yes, <laughs> it's a part of part of the um, like here the structure of pulling stitches away from one another to cross them over mm -hmm. is that you're going to end up with holes. So if you've ever knit cables like standard cables, you'll notice you get little gaps where you've stretched those stitches over one another. That's mm -hmm. the space in the fabric. Um, <clears throat> stretching really just stretching open and blocking does help so yeah if you Deborah if yours look like there are holes on each side or you noticed in mine that's normal and it's part mm -hmm. of like the lacy appeal of the shawl too in my in my opinion um <laughs> yeah. so what's the optimum number of stitches worked before you start the cross hatching so what I would say, what I would suggest is as you're nearing the end. So if my number is 12 here, that's my usual, if I was in the middle of a row, I have for my style of knitting and whatever my, my yarn width, I've got 12 wraps. If I'm approaching the end of the row and I, I'm, I'm approaching one of my pooling colors. So I'm in my red and I'm getting to the end of the row. I only have three stitches left. I would knit those three in my pooling yarn and just plain knit or work my decrease, whatever. And then on the next row, where I have all this open space, that's where I would work my next cross hatch. So you kind of make that call as you're nearing the end of the row or- And then you might have only 10 stitches to work the cross hatch on or something. Yeah, right. and then as you come over them on the next row and purl them back, you'll if you're using the cross hatch color, that's fine because it'll still look like it's bled into that same color. Um, mm -hmm. Suzanne, do you have any? Yeah, you can probably you'll find see that on the edge. Session. You'll see that on the edges. Yeah. And the other yeah. thing that I ran into is I might finish one, but then I might have where um, when I came back at the end of the next row, I was still in, I, I was starting my pooling color again, and I might not want to put a cross hatch right on top of a cross hatch. So mm -hmm. I might work a few stitches just to push it over just a little exactly, bit. Exactly, to yeah. scoot it over. Yep. And it doesn't matter too much. I mean, at the time, like as you're knitting it, it might like feel a little bit like, oh, it's not like spacing out. But if you just like go with it and keep going, you know, then oh, if you take, take a step back and look at it overall, you know, it looks cool. Yeah. Right. And there will be moments where, as Laura was saying, they start to pool on top of the pool. So in addition to having your little cross hatches that you're making, they're also lining up in a way that's not appealing to you. You can snip out a couple inches of your yarn and just mm -hmm. offset everything. You know, treat it like you've got a new ball of yarn cut out three inches even, and that will offset the repetition of where those hatches are landing, mm -hmm. if that's what you want to do. Yeah. And um, I will also say that as you work the point, Remember that your stitch count is consistently changing. So you probably don't have to make a lot of those fixes because yeah. you're getting larger. And, and just like when you're um when you would knit a sock that's pooling, a slightly different stitch count might not <clears throat> result in that pooling. Because your stitch count is changing, they're gonna line up slightly differently on subsequent rows. Yeah. Um so Nan asked if it's a smaller cross hatch, say four stitches, do you still wrap three times? I did. But if you, that would be an interesting thing to try. I didn't even think of that, Dan, to, to, to make only two wraps, let's say, and then mm -hmm. cable over a two wrap. I occasionally- um, Like if your skein is different too, like if you're, if you have one that's not quite half, half, you know, color wise. Yeah, this is it like might 50%, be interesting. Yeah, 50% yeah, pooling color. I, I sometimes did a smaller one if it was almost right on top of a bigger one because I felt like it pulled the fabric yeah, in a little bit more so that like, I didn't have uh -huh. a little baby one. Yeah, yeah, I did do a couple one. baby ones. <laughs> oh, it's so I cute. thought when I did a big one and it was like, oh, it was just too big and there were it was like one hole right next to the other. And so yes, you can totally experiment with it. Um the issue is that if you have a full length of pooling and you wrap only twice, it's going to be like 15 or 16 stitches wide, and that's too hard. Um, yeah. but if you're just gonna you have shorter... several stitches and do maybe a little four wrap or four four two and two cross hatch and then keep going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if yeah, like or if again, this stain is about 50% red and 50% the pooling color, or you could reverse that like Suzanne did in her awesome cowl. Um, but let's say you have a skein where it's only this much of your pooling color, you would only have enough there to do a couple wraps. So yeah, there you might wanna do a two stitch wrap instead of a three stitch wrap. 
Um, so it depends on your loop and where you have the colors. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's all. Thank you. Awesome. There's so many possibilities. Isn't it so fun? Like <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. you just have to, it's sort of like, you just have to dive off <laughs> Of the diving board into, into it, the into the, exactly, um, to go with the theme, um, just to get a sense of how it's all going to work out. Um, let's just check the questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, it, Linda, it's okay not to cross hatch on the edges. And in fact, do not. On the first and last two stitches, those should just be stocking at the whole way. Otherwise, you get really wacky, wonky sides. So, um, and then about this sample. Um, this, this, well, I'll just let Laura answer it. Well, I'm not sure. Okay. So the original, <laughs> the original scarf size was done with 800 yards of yarn and mm -hmm. ours has 600 yards. So it's because I had three quarters, the amount of yardage, I did three quarters, the stitch count, and I ended up at 71. I would say you could do anywhere between 71 and 75 and come out still at approximately the same length. I, I happen to like this version better than this width on this scarf size better than mine. So I would highly recommend. No, I will this. say. And then it's just three of the mini skeins, three of the, the pooling yeah. mini skeins from. No, I the, will yeah, say the, if yeah. you want to make the big version, you can buy two sets of the mini skeins and then yeah, you, you can make a huge all size. And that yeah. would be lovely. I might be tempted. And one thing that we were discussing before we turned on the cameras um, was that um, you should weigh your yarn after you've finished your point. So weigh your yarn, it'll be whatever, let's pretend this is a 100 gram ball. You've knit your point and now you have 50 grams remaining. That means you used 50 grams for your triangle. When you get to the other end of the scarf, you can go until you have 50 grams remaining and that's what you need to finish off the end of the scarf. Mm -hmm. Hope that made sense. But basically, you figure out how much yarn in terms of grams made the first point so that you know how much yarn to save for the final point. Yeah. yeah. Um, beautiful. Okay. Wait, I, I still get to give away these gift cards. Right. <laughs> so right. we have we have two $20 gift cards to give away. Um, so everybody open your chats, get ready. I'm going to ask some questions um about this and i'm gonna take um i'm gonna take the third answer the third correct answer um so just to encourage you to get it in right away but um you know make it a little bit more random so okay so the first question is i'm watching the chat here the first question is what um how many times do you wrap the yarn per stitch um in Shana's pattern oh yeah that was too <laughs> whoa you guys are on it <laughs> All right, all right, all right. So I will take uh, Linda. Linda uh, Gustafsson is the winner. So you won uh, the first gift card. You can um, send a message to Zen on, in the chat. Um, you can send a private message to them with your email and they will get you a $20 gift card that can be used on anything in the site. Um, and we will be posting the, and I think we have already posted the, a link to these particular pooling yarns. Um, <clears throat> So that's fun. And I get to give out one more. Um, so stay with me here. Um, let's see, what else, what else? Um, I'm gonna do a, a hard one. This one's really hard, I think. What color is Shana's nail polish? Mm -hmm. Show them, Shana. <laughs> I know, <laughs> you guys are too good. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to make it a little easier. I okay, did my nails so, just for all of you. <laughs> okay, so so what color is Shana's nail polish? Pink. Okay, we got a lot of that. All I right, needed, so yeah, I needed happy today. One, so I'm, two, I'm gonna give this one to uh, Janice. Janice Mara, you are the winner. So yay! <laughs> so you get uh, the twenty dollars gift certificate. So send your email over to Zen so they know. Um, and yeah. Yay. So I think we can go back. Do you have more? Um, yeah, I'm going, going to show to how to wrap on the knit side and then maybe just okay. for giggles, I'll do a bobble or something to show everybody, you know, the possibilities. Oh. It yes. could be cool to even combine cross hatches and bobbles, but he, there goes my designer's brain, right? Like, yeah. what else can I do? What else so can I do? Possibilities and only so much time. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And congrats to the winners. Thanks for noticing my nail polish. <laughs> Kind of hard to miss, I guess. All right. So, so here we go. I'm going to switch back over to this 
screen. And what I did here so that I could start on the knit side is I just cut the yarn. So please forgive me, folks who <laughs> get sad to see yarn cut. All right, so here we go. I'm going to reattach it here on the knit side. Just because the way it was pooling, I didn't think I would hit a knit row um, for a while. Okay, so I'm going to knit a couple stitches until I get to my pooling color. Do one more. So I'm right at the cusp of my pooling color where it hits. And okay, again, I'm a continental knitter. I'll do my first couple stitches in English style. So I insert my needle into the stitch and I wrap one, two, three times around the right hand needle before removing it from the stitch. So instead of having one loop on my needle, I have three. So I go in and I wrap. Oop. I grip, I find the yarn first and then one, two, three, and then complete the stitch. All right, just so, there we go. I'm gonna switch over now to, oop, to my regular type of knitting. So I'm going in one, two, three. I'm wrapping three times around the needle for each stitch. So yeah, this can be done with two stitch wrap. You could wrap it twice if you wanted to. You'd have a much shorter span or height of your stitch. And as Laura was saying, you don't want to do this with some, you don't want to end up with like 16 stitches that are really short. It would be kind of impossible to move them over um, when you when you get to doing that cable section. So it's possible, but not always advisable. And if you end up with a yarn with a very long expanse, perhaps even with this one, that it was 50% of the yarn skein was the pooling color, I could have wrapped four times and made a very dramatic drop. Um, but okay, so here we go. Let's see for just for fun, let's count and see what we have. And you don't have to count every time. I'm just doing it here with you so that you get a sense. You can count after you've dropped them too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Ah, 13. Look at that. Okay, so this time I even have a different number than my last time. And that's fine. In my original sample, I teetered between um, seven, eight, and nine wraps per, or, you know, stitches per pooling segment. So here we go. I get to my first wrap stitch and I'm just going to slide it off and over letting those extra wraps drop. So now I have this very long stitch. Okay, <clears throat> so now I have 13 loops here on the needle. What I'm going to do is grab the first half plus one. So the first seven, when you have an uneven number, you, this, the extra stitch should go in at the end. That's just a rule I came up with. It probably wouldn't hurt if you did it the opposite way, but I'm pulling those over the other six. So now my stitches are out of order, they're cabled. And sometimes I had to hold the stitches in place like this in the center as I was working them. So now here, since I'm on a purl row, I'm going to purl each of these stitches. Occasionally they wiggle out of order where say stitch number seven and stitch number eight get out of place. Here I have all the stitches in order, but you may have to wiggle them back into place. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So here we go. Those are all nice and straight, but like right here, you can see this blue stitch is crossing over and pretending like it's meant to be in the middle of the row or in the middle of these stitches when really it's meant to be here. Same as this stitch here. So occasionally you may just have to take a peek and make sure everything's laying flat. If you care about that sort of thing, I will say on some of my cross hatches, some of those stitches, I didn't worry too much about it. And I just went with the flow and it was fine. It's very funky and organic, but if you want it to look very precise, then yeah, you would, you should figure out, oop, there we go, the order in which they're sitting and then knit them in that order or purl them in this case. One at a time, and it's awkward because there are these elongated stitches that we've just cabled. It's, you know, it sure is weird to do, but with great results, I think that you get this really amazing finished look. So those are our cross hatches. And actually, I think where I detangled this one, I didn't actually need to because here it is coming out of that space. So, yep. So it even makes me kind of cross my eyes and go, wait a second. But yeah, 
but this is the crosshatch. And here in the actual shawl, I probably would avoid doing them right over each other if I could help it. I mean, here I have this nice row of red in between, but perhaps I would have scooted this one over a little bit. If I had more stitches to play with, maybe I would have knit two stitches in my crosshatch color before starting the double wraps, just to offset it a little bit from the previous one. Yeah. So, and then I wanted to also share, you don't have to just do crosshatch stitches with this type of technique. You could also do bobbles or anytime you get to your complementary color, if you're doing a stockinette piece, you could just do a ribbing and that would be enough to give it a little bit of a different texture from your other color. So this type of pooling is not necessarily, like there's so many options with it, but let's just try for a really funky bobble, which this one would be because it's a big amount of stitches. So here I'm going to knit, yarn over, knit, yarn over. This will be a big bobble because yeah, again, it's a big amount of yarn. I'm knitting backwards here. That's how I do my bobbles. So I don't have to turn every row, but here I'm just knitting my, let's see, seven bobble stitches. Just to give you a sense of the possibilities. And again, this will all vary depending on the type of yarn you're using and how big the skein repetition is. And, how, and let me know if you have questions as I'm doing this too. So here I'm going back. So I'm just working back and forth only on these bobble stitches. And this is similar to what Suzanne was doing in her cowl where she's got the short rows. She's working just a portion of the fabric in her pooling color. Okay, and I'm nearing the end of my pooling color. Oh, I'm there actually. So let's see, maybe this row, I should have closed it up. All right, so let's, I'm gonna fudge it. Um, I didn't really have a plan for this type of bobble. I was just going with the flow. So let's fudge and see what happens. We will do knit one, knit two together, pass slip stitch over, and then we can knit these four together. Again, I'm just fooling around here. You could get, you know, a real bobble pattern and um, use that instead. But here we go. So I still have a little bit left of my yarn here. No worries. I'll just knit it in and kind of roll with it. But now for my pooling, I have a little bobble instead of a cross hatch. So you could do some crazy shawl. Um, you know, you could use my base pattern for the cross hatch, that's the parallelogram, and do a shawl like this where you throw in bobbles here and there. Maybe if you have a section where you have too much pooling of the cross hatches over one another, you throw a bobble in instead of a cross hatch. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so excited to see if any of you go for that. Um, or you could do a half half. You could do a half the dance class cowl and, and a half a oh, cross hatch. That would be so cool. We could do a little. That would be um, awesome. Well, and I know Roxanne actually, if if these are a little too bright for you, um, Roxanne actually worked a wrap where she just worked her con her pooling color in Garter Ridge. So, you know, she basically did a stockinette shawl. She was doing kind of a triangular shawl. And every time she mm -hmm. did her pooling, she just did it. She, purled or knit, you know, depending on whether she was on the right side or the wrong side, but it just created a little ridge. So that would be like a much more subtle way to do it. Um, yes. if, if you're not quite bright. Yeah. yeah, it does concentrate the colors. So when you have, you know, when you, you see these, they're kind of bright skeins, like high contrast, but you kind of need that to show off the, the crosshatch, but it does like concentrate the, the color, um, you know, so you do get more of a really different look than you would if you just knit plain um, these yarns. That's the yeah, thing. we worked the bobble with the pooling, the pooling section. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so here and on my, on my needle, I've got the bobble in the white color, the white speckle, and then the remainder of my stitches are in the red. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, I mean, there are a couple stitches that overflowed just because of the nature of bobbling, but yes. Um, yeah. and, and the Zen yarns work really well with this cross hatch because um, the pooling, you know, the color that, that Shana used to pull, or Laura when she did it, but to, to do the pooling cross hatch um, is a little bit, you know, variegated. It's not just the purple. Um, so it shows up, you know, kind of differently. So 
you you do can you play with the skein that you have and decide what you want to be the pooling color. <laughs> well, and I will say that on the skein that I did, and I think that one's dragon fruit. Um, I can't remember what the what the official name for the for the that colorway is. Um, but I will say that I tried to do the cross hatches in purple and it didn't show up that well. So you may mm. find that one of your colors really tells you what it wants to be. When we did the sample, we thought about doing a portion of the sample with purple cross hatches and yellow background. Mm. Um, and they were just getting lost. So and I think I might have showed this before, but oh, yes. this is the, the dance class cowl that, that we did last great. time. Okay. Um, but this these two, they're the same color. It's the same color skein. It's just here I chose to pop the um the blue. And here I chose to pop the black. And even though there was more, the black was like a longer color repeat. So I have these kind of trails that go off of the black, but that's okay. So, it, but it just shows you how different it looks. And I think I have. Yeah, I love that example. I really do too. It's awesome. It's so, so here's cool. the stain, the, the specific, you know, color that I was using. Um, so in, in mine, I, I don't quite use as much of Shana. It's not just half and half. I used um, this to pool with, the blue part. Gotcha. And so I have this extra. Um, and then the other time I chose to pool the gray, um, the darker. So I don't know. It's just cool how many options there are and different ways it works out. So For sure. To, oh my gosh. That's <laughs> so cool. I really like it. I really love the little nubs. <laughs> Okay, so think think of your last questions because we're getting towards where we're winding down. I will tell you that um, our next tutorial Tuesday, we're still working on it. So you can sign up for our newsletter um, to be notified. And um, obviously you guys are mostly on our newsletter <laughs> because you've gotten these before, but if you're not, go ahead and sign up if you're new here tonight and somebody sent you the link. Um, we are also going to be at Vogue Live yeah. this coming weekend at 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. on Sunday. I went ahead and put a sign up in there just so you can see it. Um, and we will, uh, like I said, 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. I believe those are half hour slots. We'll be showing lots of our project kits. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Suzanne Eastern will be modeling. Time zone, right? It's Eastern uh, yes, time zone. Eastern, sorry, Eastern time zone. <laughs> Um, so any other questions or otherwise I will let uh, Sheena and Suzanne finish us up. I, I guess I don't have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me think. That. Yeah, I mean, this was a blast. It's fun sharing all these ideas with everybody. And I love mm -hmm. being here too and talking with Suzanne and Laura because then I end up getting inspired. And of course, you know, I'm going to sign off and start swatching things. And, I know. And, <laughs> we'll have to do a collaboration, Suzanne, where we put together all of our little pools and yes. <laughs> make some <laughs> epic, epic piece. <laughs> oh, that was one other thing I wanted to mention. If you have a lot of color you're worried that it's going to be too much of your little cross hatches or your bobbles if you have a solid color that matches your backdrop color you can stripe that in so you could do two rows like in the instance of Suzanne's scarf that she's got on now you could do two rows of purple plain solid color purple and then do, your, do a few cross hatch rows and then do another two rows of plain purple, then two cross hatch rows to kind of give it a little extra space. Space it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want yeah, to, do. yeah, tone it down or whatever. I happen to love it. It looks like a field of flowers. It is so yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's fun. And I'm finding like, I was trying to find things that looked good with it and thinking, gosh, it's really bright. I'm not gonna have the right like wardrobe items to work. But then, you know, it's surprising how many colors go with it. Like, yeah. I don't have my hair. Like but. your cranberry dress looks great because it picks yeah. up all the little flecks of the, of the. Yeah. Um, or like, you know, the, the jean jacket looks good. So it looks good with that. It looks good with this like yellow dress. It looks good with a lot of different colors. So that's kind of the fun, fun yes. thing with, with the Zen colors too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I'm loving this one, like the lipstick pink and the, oh my gosh, it's awesome. Yeah. So, and this would go with a ton too. So. Yeah. Lots of fun, always with the Zen. Thank you, Zen, for hosting yeah. us tonight and for sponsoring the tutorial Tuesday. And thank you all for being here. We hope you'll join us in the future and um, share photos of your pieces. Send them to yes, Zen. We love to see them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Reina. Thanks, Suzanne. Good seeing you.